Christian Choi is um, a professor at the uh, Paul Giannella School of Computer Science and Engineering and also in the Linguistics Department at the University of Washington. She's an expert on natural language processing and machine learning um, and uh, has uh, too many accomplishments to know here, but she won the Mar Prize for um, her really innovative work that combines uh, processing of natural language and uh, computer vision. Um, Luna Dong is a principal scientist at Amazon, where she leads a group building um, the Amazon Knowledge product, product knowledge graph. Um, she's. Can you hold it a little closer? And can people hear me better now? That's yeah. better. Uh, okay. Um, she's an expert in data management and artificial intelligence, um, and won the Early Career Award the OTB gave for her work on um, knowledge fusion. Um, and then Kevin Jamison is also a professor, uh, in fact, the guest friend professor of machine learning um, and artificial intelligence at the University of Washington and an expert in reinforcement learning. So we've got a great panel. Um, and I'm going to start off with a couple questions, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for, uh, for questions from uh, the rest of you. If you're interested, raise, raise your hand. Um, but I guess let me start off by saying, um, that in, in AI, all I hear is like deep learning, deep learning, deep learning. So I'd like to start off and, and ask, um, deep learning is great, but is there some other machine learning or AI technology that you think isn't getting as much uh, attention as it should? Okay, so can you hear me? Let me get started. Uh, so uh, we are working on knowledge graph, as um, uh, Dan just said. And uh, in a lot of, uh, so basically a knowledge graph, you can consider it as structured data. And I don't know if you have heard that uh, deep learning so far has been working great for uh, voice, for images, for natural language, the text, for videos. But a lot of people would say, well, for structured data, where you have a good structure for tables, for example, um, just uh, like um, a random forest, those uh, tree-based models are good enough. And so for us, in the past uh, several years, what we are trying to figure out is where we should use deep learning and where we should not. And especially for this uh, like a graph, it is a graph, it is not just a table, it does not have very like a regular structure, very simple structure. But on the other hand, it's, it has structure. It is not as irregular as the text, etc. And so in our, when we built the knowledge graph, we found that whenever we have uh, something like uh, text heavy or somewhere we have a very complex structure, uh, then we really need the deep learning techniques. But on the other hand, uh, for some of the tasks, for example, like the entity linkage, where you try to figure out if two records from two different data sources refer to the same real world entity, the same person, the same movie, etc., then tree based models are good enough. And for us, the worst thing is actually how to collect the training data to train either deep learning models or non deep learning models. And for us, what we are very interested in is like semi-supervised learning, and um, also uh, we are somehow interested in like uh, program induction, such that with some behaviors, um, uh, like um, uh, like uh, the, the 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 for example data cleaning process that is um, uh, done by the data scientists. We want to learn from it, and then we want to be able to automatically do that for the rest of the data. She um, addressed and also expand on some other part. So um, I am very much um, a believer in deep learning. Um, however, the current form does have a lot of limitations. In particular, it's really data inefficient way of learning things. So. It's really great if you do have a lot of data, but if not, then it's pretty useless. So um, in the case of the Alexa Prize um, challenge that the University of Washington team ran, that I was part of, uh, for that conversational AI challenge, we couldn't really make um, deep learning to produce anything uh, robust enough for us to put it on the cloud. It just was not. And it's not just us. Um, 
other people who tried doing that uh, didn't really perform very well. So um, the takeaway message is that when you don't have a data that is very much tuned well into the uh, use case of that model, uh, today things don't work out very well. So um, the way we worked really well compared to other teams, part of that um, really important component was sort of a knowledge graph that when I was talking about earlier, in particular we had really good, strong content that covered a lot of uh, current news events and so forth that we stored in a structured form. So um, I, I do think that um, uh, there are many cases where knowledge does matter and when that's the case, it, there's really nothing wrong with going with um, other non-deep learning approaches um, <coughs> and storing them as such, and deep learning may or may not be able to handle that today. Um, <clears throat> as far as other, um, more broadly speaking, in natural language processing as well as computer vision, if you look closer to what does work well today, um, it tends to be machine translation and speech recognition in NLP, maybe some other parsing task as well, and then in the case of computer vision, usually it's uh, object recognition that works really well, but for other uh, applications, um, they may still be the state-of-the-art models, however, it may or may not be strong enough for commercializing something out of uh, <coughs> learning models. So again, for those cases, um, oftentimes there may be other approaches uh, that one needs to think about in order to make things better. So I, I think in, oftentimes it's uh, in a commercialized setting, uh, there may, you may be able to narrow down the domain in such a way that um, you don't have to go fully end to end with deep learning and then make something work nonetheless, despite how deep learning isn't doing the magic that it's supposed to do. Yeah, um, deep learning. <laughs> It's uh, it's in some senses the the best and worst thing that's ever happened in machine learning. Um, the best in the sense that it's created a lot of excitement. It has uh, gotten achievements that you know, has surpassed all uh, previous simple models. Um, and so it's really amazing uh, what it's achieved. Uh, however, I also think that it's somehow troubling uh, when you go in talk to uh, companies, particular smaller companies, and they, uh, they, they want to go and you know, build some predictive model. And uh, nowadays, deep learning with its, with its hype and it's so popular these days that their first tool is now to train a deep neural network to you know, predict a very simple task. Um, and uh, I think that this is a trend that is somehow troubling, and it's also coming up through the uh, academic cycle as well. Um, students are you know, going to grad school and undergrad uh, and thinking that these are the models without actually getting the fundamentals of learning uh, the basics of these learning tasks because uh, that's been covered so uh, well so far. Uh, simple models can actually work very, very well. Um, and if your task is very difficult that requires the flexibility of uh, deep learning, then I'm all for it. Uh, but just an enorm it just requires an enormous amount of data. Uh, my work is mostly working in the idea of actually collecting that data. So how do you actually come up with, you know, deep learning is mostly dealing with this problem of I have this enormous data set, uh, now I want to predict Y from X. But now that we've done these amazing machine learning models to be able to do these predictive tasks that we have on these static sets of data, how do we actually close that loop and actually collect that data in an efficient way? Um, I think this is actually one of the most important things that's not getting uh, a ton of attention. Um, and this is actually one of the biggest challenges in deep learning because the way that you can collect data in an adaptive way, this sort of uh, very deliberate way, requires a lot of constraints. Somehow you need to know what you know in order to uh, figure out, you know, collect new data to, to reduce uncertainty. And that's a big challenge for deep learning. Um, so the question was, you know, are there trends that are being missed in machine learning right now uh, that are not getting as much attention when they should? And I think one of the biggest trends that is becoming more popular but is still uh, very much in the back burner is uh, the fact that we live in a dynamic world. You know, we are 
If you think of machine learning as we have this data set and we're trying to predict y from x uh, on the static data set. And then we want to generalize where this data is coming from the same IID source, this thing that the data that I was wanting to test this on is from the same distribution that I trained on. This is patently false in almost every situation. Uh, and how do we deal with that? How do we model with that? How do we collect data in a way that is aware that your data is going to be changing every so often? And uh, how do we build models that can be efficiently updated day to day without you know, doing a direct you know, whole solve from an initial solution? Um, I think that is one of the biggest issues of today is dealing with dynamic data and coming up with dynamic solutions. And uh, in the topic of reinforcement learning, how do we collect that data? How do we take actions uh, on, say, a web platform uh, in a retail environment in order to drive more sales or click or discoveries? Um, because uh, just as you're collecting data for to learn a better classifier or a better regression model, uh, we could be using this to predict um, new scientific discoveries. You know, how do we figure out the same, you know, if a measurement takes three months in a wet lab, how do we come up with efficient ways of getting the same amount of information using uh, a small number of measurements? And uh, I think these are the, the, the biggest trends that we need to see. Um, I, all of you guys make great points. I'm going to pick up on around, but let me just ask one follow-up question. So what is your go-to machine learning model or models that if you have a problem with only a couple hundred or a thousand parameters, instead of using deep learning, you would first try what? Always, always, always linear. <laughs> you should never, ever run anything before you try linear. <laughs> like it, 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 there's no excuse for never trying for not trying linear first. It take it they're incredibly efficient solutions to solve the biggest data matrices you can imagine, and it takes two seconds to validate and check. That it, that should be the first thing you try. I don't care what you're doing. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, which it usually doesn't, then you can start uh, moving into something else. But uh, it, always it should be. A um, okay, so I'm um, trying to keep all these threads uh, in, in my head, but uh, Lenny, it seems like knowledge graphs are great. So can you, uh, I think you described what they were a little bit before, but um, how, how, does, how does one create one? Okay, so uh, let me, okay. let me start with uh, what is a knowledge graph. A knowledge graph is a graph. And so each node represents an entity. It could be a person, it could be an organization, it could be a movie, it could be a product. And each edge represents a relationship between the entities. For example, this person works for this organization, this person is the CEO of this company, this uh, movie has the, uh, is directed by this director, so on and so forth. So uh, different from many other graphs, such as social graphs, a uh, knowledge graph is more about factual information. So the information is more about, for this movie, uh, what is the uh, country that it is first released, what is the release year, and what is the duration with the actor or the, uh, with the director, so on and so forth. And the information is really collected from, hopefully, many, many different sources. And uh, how many of you know uh, Google Knowledge Graph? Yes. So Google Knowledge Graph is used to support one third of Google search. And it is really, uh, it started in the year of 2012, and uh, it is uh, playing a very important role in uh, mobile search. And, um, and then the information there is basically um, collected from many different data sources. And uh, the question is now how to hook up all of the data from different sources. If, uh, let me just uh, use a very simple example. If I have uh, movies from Rotten Tomato and I have movies from IMDb, and then how can I know these actors are actually the same actor, even though it is from two different sources? and uh, these movies are the same. How can I know that um, the relationship uh, mentioned in this source and in that source is the same? And uh, what we want to go to, like uh, the 
uh, the, the massive sources like the web sources, how can we automatically extract such information? And then, once we have the graph, how to use it, how to use it in search, how to use it to improve uh, natural language understanding, and how to use it to answer questions. How can we mine something interesting from the graph? For example, how do we know which uh, actors are important actors? In other words, what are the important entities in the graph? And then once we know that, how can we use that to improve recommendation? So these are all of the sort of uh, problems we need to solve to collect the knowledge graph and then to apply the knowledge graph. Um, so Google has a knowledge graph, clearly. Amazon has a knowledge graph. I think Microsoft's got a knowledge graph. Um, and Google was created when they acquired a company that made Freebase. Um, do we all have to go out and build our own knowledge graphs, or is there room for a startup to create a knowledge graph, like get acquired by, well, I don't know, Google's already got one. So, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, so Google Knowledge Graph, let, let me actually ask you this question. So at uh, Amazon, we are building this uh, product knowledge graph. So how many of you think um, product knowledge graph is a subset of this uh, Google generic knowledge graph? Raise your hand. Uh, how many people think they are overlapping? So there are generic knowledge graphs that do not belong to product knowledge graph, and there are product knowledge that do not belong to generic knowledge graph. Okay, so the rest of you must be thinking generic knowledge graph should be a subset of uh, uh, product knowledge graph. <laughs> Nothing should exist if uh, Jeff Bezos does not sell it, right? <laughs> So as you can see, just the talking about products, we are using it, we are seeing it every day, and we actually do not have a very good way so far, or mature, uh, mature way to collect all of the product knowledge. And uh, the Google way of uh, collecting knowledge so far is still more of a data curation. And uh, when we go from, um, like, uh, the, so, so let me put it in this way. So Google Knowledge Graph, basically collect a lot of information from Wikipedia, and then also add knowledge for another like uh, five to 10 major verticals. The vertical could be movie, could be music, etc. But when we have a lot of verticals, and when we need to collect uh, data for a lot of, uh, from a lot of different sources, the problem is not solved. So it's not clear yet how to create the most complete product knowledge graph. It is not clear how to create the most complete medical knowledge graph. So there are a lot of specialties that we don't know yet how to collect all of the knowledge, how to collect all of the data, integrate the data, and clean the data. So I think it's a lot of, a, it's a big space for development. Um, yeah. Uh, Amazon has a lot of services uh, that they offer, and they're getting more and more into the space of you know, vision products and language products. Is there room for a knowledge graph as a service? Mm, you mean knowledge graph for all of the services, Amazon services? No, as a service itself, to query and to... I see, I see too. So uh, a service that provides the knowledge. Yeah, I think Dennis definitely, said. yes, that's definitely one. should come with your prime probably. subscription. <laughs> <laughs> a certain amount of knowledge every, every day. <laughs> but seriously. Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely one uh, promising area to go, direction to go. Yeah, But certainly, uh, it's not so easy because uh, data is expensive. It's so hard to collect data. It's so hard to clean the data. And it's also a lot of legal issues related to providing data. So it's a long way to go. Um, okay, I've stayed away from deep learning as long as, as, long as I can. Um, so you guys say, well, we really shouldn't try it unless we got lots of data, we really need lots of data. What is lots of data? So um, I know, Yejin, maybe all of you use deep learning. How much data do you need to make it, make it work? Can you give some examples? 
the more the better. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so um, for language models, so for training pretty good language models, one billion words tends to give you pretty good language models, but um, it may actually do better if you can uh, fit in even more, although at that point probably Fitting just more data alone is not enough, but you need to start messing with the architecture, uh, hyperparameters, which include how many layers of the recurrent neural network do you want to stack up, and what kind of skip connections do you want to uh, insert in between different layers, and uh, what is your hidden vector size, and there are some very long list of these boring hyperparameters that one has to try and find out um, which gives you better results. So it is really case by case and then um, sometimes you can get away with a much smaller data set depending on uh, what exactly you do. So there's no magic number. Um. Them's fighting words. Kevin, are the hyperparameters boring? Are <laughs> <laughs> um, hyperparameters boring? Uh, I spent a lot of time on hyperparameter optimization. Um, the, the truth is, is that, you know, as much as we'd like to be able to stand up here and say that we're deep learning experts and we know how all these parameters interact and we can choose these hyperparameters, you know, in our sleep and you know, given the data set, I'll just tune this thing up and one shot will be good, great. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, it, it's an enormous amount of tweaking and tuning, and uh, it really, you know, makes you feel bad when you can't train these things right. Uh, and so part of my work has been involved in, you know, okay, um, we really don't know how these things interact. Instead of doing something like, well, in academia we call it grad student descent, where you pick a setting and then you go downhill, and you pick another setting, you get it valued, you go downhill. Um, that's, you know, uh, I, people are way too value, valuable for that. Um, you, we've got to have an automated way of choosing hyperparameters. And um, the, these, the, when they're very, very difficult to deal with, um, I often take the approach of not trying uh, to be incredibly intelligent about picking these hyperparameters, but being more intelligent about the computation aspect of it. You know, these, training these deep learning networks is, takes an enormous amount of computational power and time. And what we should be optimizing for is developer time, not you know time on the computer being training. And so I think in the era where we have uh, something like AWS, where you know I could have a thousand machines for one hour or uh, one machine for a thousand hours, you should absolutely take a thousand machines for one hour. Um, just do a massive loop parallel and choose all these hyperparameter settings in an efficient and intelligent way um, in a sense where you're optimizing over um, computation. So don't worry about you know, trying to figure out how all these things interact. Just spin up uh, hundreds, thousands of nodes uh, and for a small amount of time, for a small amount of time, don't laugh, you know, it's, it takes a little bit of money, but um, it's much more cheaper on the long end uh, of things when you're paying developers to do it. Um, but you can do things very efficiently with different algorithms by doing, using tricks, like after training these things for a small amount of time, you can start killing off ones that look unpromising. Um, and with these very asynchronous um, and efficient parallelization schemes for uh, hyperparameter tuning, I think that's the, uh, the only way to do it. Um, but yeah, I think hyperparameters are not going away. There, um, it seems that um, somehow you may get maybe a bonus in your paper if you add a new hyperparameter. Uh, so I think that uh, we have to get to deal with them in a, in a rational way. But um, I, I am actually, you know, I joke about it, but I think that is a startling trend um, that we don't think of an algorithm as any worse if it's introducing new hyperparameters. I think we should be moving towards models that reduce the number of hyperparameters, not increase them. One thing I want to add is, um, I mean, sorry, this is less about the hyperparameters, but more about the number of training examples with what we need. So we try to combine training with active learning, and we found that can save a lot of training examples. So taking entity linkage as a link. Not to interrupt, can you just explain what active learning is? 
Yes, active learning basically means you will choose the labels you need uh, 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 to, to improve your model. So basically you run your learning model and then you look at the results and then you will try to do some more sampling to ask for more labeling and then you use the new labels to improve your model. And our experience is that we try to use random forest to uh, train uh, entity linkage, basically deciding what are the same uh, person and uh, same movie, etc. And we can save the number of uh, training examples by two orders of magnitude to reach like 99% of precision and recall. And then we thought, okay, this is random forest. Can we do the same using deep learning? And then we use uh, uh, RNN to do some uh, extraction, like uh, attribute value extraction. And again, we can save like a uh, uh, half to two thirds of the training labels to obtain the same quality. Um, I guess the next question I had, looking at a lot of AI papers, or rather over the course of my career, the way we used to build AI systems is by building different modules and putting them together. So in natural language, there might be a parser, and on top of that, we put some sort of semantic understanding, and on top of that, we would put something that did question answering. And now it seems like more and more of these systems are built are, are built um, as a single monolithic unit that's then trained um, all together. And so my question to you guys is, um, should, uh, should people going out there be going to these end-to-end -end systems or sticking with the modularity of um, more component-based architecture? So um, if the data um, does allow you to do end-to-end -end training, I think that's a really good way to uh, get a better performance almost always these days. And the reason being, if you have a pipeline system with, let's just say, two components, each of those having 70% accuracy, if you have a 70% accuracy combined with another 70% accuracy, you quickly have 49% accuracy. So uh, the longer pipeline you have, this error propagation becomes a serious problem very, very quickly. Whereas if you do end-to-end -end training, basically you're making uh, the entire system to uh, learn from the final objective function more directly. So uh, you, you get to have that um, benefit. Another way to look at this is that um, basically end-to-end um, -end training can be viewed as a new kind of neural network architecture. And when you look at um, how uh, some of these um, image object recognition, for example, performance goes up, it's not just about how uh, you add more data. In, in fact, the data <coughs> stays the same. The image net data set is the same size. It's not also the case that people blindly added more layers. In fact, um, when you try to add more layers blindly, it's just impossible to train the parameters quite right because there tends to be numerical problems with more layers. The derivatives that uh, tra uh, traverse from the objective function doesn't really percolate down correctly. So usually it, it's just frustrating to train that um, giant network. However, when the uh, amazing performance again happens is when there's a, some sort of architecture innovation that does allow the network to train much easier despite that there are more layers somehow. There may be um, particular types of connections in between the layers such that um, the learning just happens much more efficiently. So um, this has been the case uh, not only for computer vision but also for um, commonly used the neural network architectures for language as well, and end-to-end um, -end training oftentimes is a type of architecture innovation. And when you do not have enough data, or you have some data so that you can dream about neural network, but just not like enormous data, um, if you somehow be creative about the network architecture, you may be able to make really good use of the existing data set. So that, that has been also part of the recent trend with the deep learning literature. Uh, I 
guess one thing I want to add is that, um, I mean, I fully agree, but on the other hand, there are systems where for different components, they are just so different that we cannot train one end-to-end uh, -end pipeline. Taking the knowledge, again, I mean, this knowledge graph as an example, extracting the knowledge and then doing the entity linkage, these are very different. And later on, we can do like the knowledge extraction, uh, sorry, from the text, etc. That is also different from uh, knowledge extraction from web. And in those cases, unfortunately, we have to uh, have different models for different modules. However, we then have a one final cleaning module, which try to find errors from all of the previous uh, steps. And that turned out to help significantly. Uh, my only comment here is that end-to-end uh, -end training can uh, always increase accuracy. And I think it's uh, for certain tasks it is necessary and uh, a no-brainer. Um, but <clears throat> there are many other situations uh, where you want the modularity, not for not because you're trying to increase accuracy um, as a primary goal, but to explain when it fails, how it failed. Uh, you, you know, if if. For instance, you know, when, as, as AI and ML goes more and more into mission critical um, and hazardous areas like self-driving cars, when they fail in a certain way, I want to know that they corrected the mistake and where did the system fail. Um, and I don't want an answer. Well, well we ran, we updated the model and ran it for a few more sets of SGD. <laughs> I think one of the first, probably the, the very first AI technology that made it into deployment is recommender systems. Probably everybody in this room is familiar with them, whether it's on Netflix or Amazon recommending products uh, to you. So a question for Kevin is, um, is this technology mature or are there, um, is there a potential to really change and improve these going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's insanely, um, Valuable resource, uh, and it's it's it, it still has not sort of saturated the amount of value we can add to companies. Um, everyone should be using it, and I think that we should try to get it more into the hands of companies earlier than than later. Um, it's always sad to hear that a company is sitting on a lot of data and not actually doing anything intelligent with it, making predictions. But um, these days, you know, over the last decades, we've seen uh, the time from model to deployment shrink from you know months to weeks to days to hours um, and now people are shipping models you know to their CDN every 30 minutes um, and that's 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 really great but um, all these recommendation systems like ads and um, like Netflix and these sorts of things are it's really even when they appear to be doing something real time and reacting to you and personalization it's really like you're, you're, you're talking to a robot with a script that was updated 30 minutes ago. Um, and I think that the, the room for improvement in these systems is actually truly interactive uh, learning. And you know the, the goal here would be a, a real life assistant, um, like the Alexa assistant that uh, Yejin was talking about. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a really, really difficult task um, still. You know, there's a lot of challenges there. And, I think that to see like a, a, a an idea of where this stuff is actually ready for prime time, um, and an idea of this interactive learning where you see this, um, a good example of this is actually uh, Amazon, um, their Shop by Look feature, uh, shopbylook.amazon.com, and if you go to that, what you do is you see some coffee tables and you know you thumbs up or thumbs down and. It, uh, you navigate through this space of you know, getting recommended a coffee table. And for anyone that's tried to search for furniture on Amazon, you can imagine that this might help a little bit. Yeah, thank you for the topics. That's very informative. Uh, my question is, like you talked about uh, one of the limitations of deep learning is the amount of data. But also, another limitation, big limitation, is the bias in data. Uh, and I'm wondering if, you know, because of the bias in data, <coughs> will that sort of like stop uh, ML technology from going forward? For example, in the fitness industry, if I have very biased data, maybe my models cannot do regulation or something. They'll say it, it does not serve all the communities. Uh, so, will that be like a you know, uh, will it stop ML trends? And two, what is your opinion about uh, gaps uh, as 
part of the machine learning technology. Because I think GANs could sort of solve the, uh, the data issues, maybe even the bias issues. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, for the first question, I think it's a really great question and in fact um, a lot of the biases that machine learning methods might produce has oftentimes have a lot to do with the data, the bias of what humans generated in the first place and machine learning methods not only mimic that bias, sometimes it does amplify that bias. So there has been some recent literature that showed how uh, especially for uh, image recognition, the bias actually get amplified. Um, and so there are um, approaches to correct that um, by having inference network that sits on top of neural network decisions, uh, such that it, it um, has a separate objective function that looks at the confidence score of the neural network um, in conjunction with the uh, desire the distribution of the labels in the predicted space. So I think one really fruitful direction to pursue uh, would be to think of how to correct the model bi bias after the fact, as well as um, uh, in, in parallel, I, I think we could also look into how to correct the bias in the data set in the first place. Um, sometimes, um, I, I think both are really good directions. Correcting bias in the data set is not necessarily very, very easy, but um, to some degree that can be done as well. And then uh, finally, so GANs um, does generate... Can I just say one yeah. thing there? I think that the, those techniques work for certain kinds of biases that maybe you're interested in, like gender or race or something, but, uh, but other kinds of bias that may be in the data, if you're not aware of them, those techniques aren't going to work. Right. right. So those will only work for biases that you are trying to correct, but it's not going to work for everything. Um, so about GANs, um, it's a, for uh, people who may not be familiar with it, it's a particular kind of a, um, uh, setting up the neural network um, by and large to um, learn to generate data samples on its own and then there's going to be a discriminator that runs on the side and they sort of uh, interact with each other such that um, the generator will be able to do a better job in uh, generating some samples. And um, I think many of you probably heard about like these um, very interesting images that um, some of these network can generate. I don't think that's going to be a solution for this, however, because um, these results tend to be more of a research concept today, such that um, their discriminators, for example, are not strong enough, their generators are not strong enough, so um, in some sense they're both the weak models talking to each other, and so um, that alone doesn't seem um, usable right away in order to really correct the serious problems with um, biases. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I do think that um, it's, it's good to think about bias problems seriously and um, it's part of the ethics questions as well and um, I'm primarily in NLP so I'm very interested in removing unwanted bias against underrepresented groups but other types of bias as well. Okay, do we have time for one last question? Yeah, one more. Okay, how much will you give me to have it be your question? Are you, <laughs> you had your hand up first. All right, I just have a question. Now. I mean, I, I think the next revolution is probably gonna be with, with knowledge graphs. I think knowledge graphs are, uh, knowledge graphs are really interesting. The, the only problem is that they, they kind of become hairballs too, really quickly, because too many things connect to many things. The ability to do, to find equivalencies, or the way you call it, what's called an entity resolution within a knowledge graph is really the key to it. Um, you guys see, I kind of gave up on them uh, in biology because I was trying to work in that space, and I was like, ah, it's a mess, and, you know. And I really, I really couldn't find a solution. You guys see a lot further. What, like, uh, I don't know if you were. Uh, if you were Jeff Hinton in 97, then I was asking you this question. And I, I think the next revolution should happen in this space. 
but what do you see? I mean, what's the, what's the problem that's going to be solved and a hint of how you're going to solve it? Because it's that's like what's missing in, in all this <coughs> stuff. What do you think is going to be? Where do you think, like if you were to, you're doing it. <laughs> but I'd be mean, like, where do you think the next revolution in that field is going to come from? Like, you can answer it in terms of what the biggest problem is, but, you know. I think you got it. <laughs> so, so the, the, the biggest problem, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. The biggest uh, problem for knowledge graph is scalability. And the reason is it's too rich. So if you think about Google Knowledge Graph, etc., it is so rich. It has like um, thousands of types and uh, thousand, uh, tens of thousands of different relationships. And the things are connected in this and other way. And we call it a rich graph. And um, it seems like that's how we uh, really like model the real world because the real world is rich, it is complex. But on the other hand, it's just a, a lot of curation work to get the data, and it needs a lot of uh, like human involvement. It's not just uh, like uh, label labeling involvement; it's uh, uh, like engineer involvement to build a big knowledge graph. So I think the next step is to make the graph less rich, make it broad, make it shallow, make it a fairly uh, simple uh, structure. However, combining that with uh, natural language, we possibly can do a beautiful job in terms of uh, question answering, conversations, and even recommendations. So I think that's the next big step for knowledge graphs. Okay. Um, great, I think we're out of time, but um, I'd like to thank the panelists very much. Yeah.